These days, people talk a lot about global citizenship, but they use the term in a very vague and unclear way. Most of them don't really mean citizenship at all, with all the rights and responsibilities that come with it. They rather speak about global citizenship as a general sense of being interested in and caring about other peoples and cultures, or following world events and knowing what is going on beyond your own country, or perhaps giving to international charities and working in international development or even just living a cosmopolitan lifestyle and traveling a lot. Oxfam defines a global citizen as someone who is aware of and understands the wider world and their place in it, who takes an active role in their community and works with others to make the planet more peaceful, sustainable and fairer. That's all very nice, but it's a bit wishy-washy and it certainly doesn't have anything to do with real citizenship. And in a similar vein, many organizations now talk about global citizenship education. And again, this is generally understood to mean educating children and adults to take a holistic world perspective, to look at social issues, to value understanding and tolerance across cultures and so on. And, and used in this very vague and very general way, many people do indeed feel that they are global citizens. A surprisingly large number of people, in fact. In the World Values Survey, a massive survey carried out with large numbers of respondents across many countries every few years, the 2014 results show that 70.5% of respondents either agreed or strongly agreed with the statement, I see myself as a world citizen. And this was no one-off rogue survey. In 2016, another huge survey was carried out across 18 countries by Globescan and the BBC World Service. And it found that 51% of respondents agreed or strongly agreed with the statement, I see myself more as a global citizen than a citizen of my country. Wow. This indicates that a global majority identify as being part of one global society. And that this identification is even more important to them than their national identification. It's really amazing. And it means that despite what the politicians try to tell us, many, many people are not taken in by nationalism and racism and xenophobia. And instead, they feel like the world is their home and humanity is their family. Former British Prime Minister Theresa May may have tried to appeal to nationalist sentiments when she spoke to the Conservative Party conference in 2016, saying, if you believe you're a citizen of the world, you're a citizen of nowhere. But it seems that many people, even in Britain, actually do feel like they are citizens of the world. As our social and economic interactions increasingly spread across the globe, as we travel more, meet more people through social media and learn about the world through the internet, many, many of us feel as if we belong to one increasingly global society. And of course, that doesn't mean that we don't also identify as British or Chinese or Nigerian or whatever just as it doesn't mean that we don't also identify as men or women or left-wing or right-wing or a whole range of other identities that we manage very easily to hold at the same time. May and other nationalists try to imply that if you feel a profound connection to the whole of humanity, then you can't possibly also feel a profound connection with your native country. But that's as stupid as saying that feeling loyalty to your friends must mean that you feel less loyalty to your family. Of course not. We can feel loyalty and connection to many people all at the same time. But there are also some truths in Theresa May's words. What she said in full was actually this. If you believe you're a citizen of the world, you are a citizen of nowhere. You don't understand what citizenship means. And it is this last bit which is true. All this vague and general talk of being a citizen of the world has absolutely nothing to do with what citizenship actually means. Citizenship is a relationship between a person and a state, in which the state gives that person particular civil, political and social rights. Social contract theory defines citizenship as a bundle of rights, primarily political participation in the life of the community, the right to vote and the right to receive certain protection from the community, as well as certain obligations. So real world citizenship would require some kind of world state which could then grant people certain rights and indeed guarantee them. This was the vision of Rosica Schwimmer and Lola Maverick Lloyd, who wanted all refugees and stateless people to be able to claim world citizenship in a real sense of the term. It was also the vision of Gary Davis, 
a peace activist who in 1948 renounced his American citizenship and declared himself world citizen number one. These activists, and many, many others like them, talked about world citizenship in a very real sense of the term. They wanted a federal layer of global government which could grant real rights to everyone. Let's consider what this might look like. First of all, pretty much all states grant their citizens the right to move around freely within the state and to live and work anywhere. So let's imagine that world citizens had this right. This on its own would be huge. It would mean that everyone, no matter where they were born, would have a world passport and be able to travel anywhere and to live and to work anywhere. Just like it is today within the US or within the EU. Borders would become minor details and everyone would be able to cross them freely. There would be no more refugees and no more stateless people. Everyone would be citizens of the world and have rights and freedoms, whatever the situation in their home country and wherever they happen to find themselves. Furthermore, in a world without borders, it would be impossible to fence people into countries in which there are no opportunities or where they can't earn a decent living or where their government is persecuting them. No, they would simply be able to leave and go somewhere better. But hang on, you say, wouldn't that mean that everybody from the poor countries would suddenly rush to the rich countries? Then there'll be overcrowding and tensions between people of different religions and ethnic groups. There won't be enough jobs to go around. It would be awful. Well, let's think about that for a bit. If the world continued to be as unequal and as unjust as it currently is, then yes, there probably would be a huge movement of people from poor to rich countries. But if that were possible, and politicians and everyone knew that, then there would be a huge incentive to balance out the inequalities and injustices in the world, so that all the countries would be more or less similar in terms of wealth and freedoms and opportunities. Rather than keep the majority of the world's population imprisoned against their will within the borders of their countries, where they have no other choice than to work in poorly paid jobs, in dangerous conditions, in order to produce the food and commodities which rich people in the West consume, we would create a fair and balanced world where everyone, no matter where they were born or the colour of their skin, would be able to make a good life for themselves. So opening all the borders would very quickly lead to a much more balanced and just world, because suddenly it would be in the interests of the rich countries to do so. Most states also grant their citizens the right to vote in elections to choose the government. So let's assume that world citizens would also be able to vote in elections to choose the federal layer of the global government. So then we would finally have global democracy and a say in global affairs. Most states also grant their citizens many other social, economic and political rights. So what rights would the world government grant to world citizens? Well, we actually already have a draft of this, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and indeed all the other human rights that have been drafted in international law since then. In the current system, all of them are really just aspirational, because there is no world government to actually grant and guarantee these rights. But if we did have a world government, and a world parliament, and world courts, and world citizenship, then we could make human rights real. So all world citizens, would actually have real human rights. Now, if we only went this far, the world would be a hugely more just and more equal place. But we could go even further. If the world's population chose to do so through democratic elections at the global level, we could decide to set up the world state on something similar to the European model, with a strong welfare state based on a system of taxation and redistribution. If we did this, we could institute some global taxes perhaps a wealth tax, or a financial transaction tax, or a carbon tax, or even a tiny income tax. And then the world state could give everyone the right to free education, free healthcare, some form of welfare, and so on. Things that many people in the rich world take for granted, whereas for those in the poorer countries could sound like a dream. This would even out the economic inequalities and the inequalities of opportunity even more. But even if we didn't go this far, even if we just chose a more right-wing American-style model of citizenship, even that would make a huge, huge difference. Now, this might all sound fanciful, but there are already several kinds of supranational citizenship, 
citizenship that is granted at a level higher than the state. Citizenship in the European Union is the best known example. People retain citizenship of their country, of France or Italy or wherever, but also gain citizenship of the European Union, which grants them rights to travel freely in the area and to live and work where they please. And just this year, the Mercosur bloc of countries in Latin America decided to do something very similar, and they launched the Mercosur Citizenship Statute, which grants a supranational Mercosur citizenship to citizens of Mercosur countries, such as Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and others. Mercosur citizens can now travel freely in the bloc and live and work in any Mercosur country. So setting up supranational citizenship is not particularly hard to do. In fact, it's eminently possible. There's no legal or technical reason that we could not create a real world citizenship for everyone. It just requires political will and for enough people to demand it. It's probably because world citizenship, real world citizenship, is such a radical and powerful idea, but the powers that be have found a way to warp and twist the term until it has come to mean something quite different, something that's much less radical and much less challenging to the status quo. But if we want real world citizenship, then we need to start saying so, and using the term in the proper way. In the 1940s, there was a massive movement calling for world citizenship. Rosika Schwimmer and Lola Maverick Lloyd wrote one of the earliest descriptions of what world citizenship could look like, and then set about lobbying governments to try to make it a reality. A few years later, Gary Davis took a more novel and direct approach, renouncing his American citizenship and simply declaring himself to be world citizen number one. He had a background in show business, and he knew how to catch the attention of the press and the people. And he used creative tactics to get himself and his cause on the front pages of newspapers. On the 19th of November 1948, for example, he interrupted the United Nations session that was meeting in Paris and shouted out from the observer's balcony, demanding a world government and world citizenship in order to end war and bring about peace. Another tactic he used was to camp out in international territory, places like the UN or the borderlands between two countries, where national police forces could not evict him. And then he would give press conferences about the stupidity of dividing the world into separate countries. Davis also worked with Lola's daughter, Mary Maverick Lloyd, to establish the International Registry of World Citizens, and they registered over 950,000 people who declared themselves world citizens. And later on, he also set up an organization that issued world passports, symbolic world passports. And he and other activists tried to use them when they traveled to other countries. Sometimes they succeeded, sometimes they were arrested, but many of the times their antics made it into the newspapers and it made people think about what a passport is and why it works as it does. Arthur Kanagis, an American filmmaker who recently made a documentary about Gary Davis, recalled, he used to say, the world passport is a joke, but so are all other passports. They're a joke on us, and ours is a joke on the system. Now, these kinds of creative actions helped him to build up a following of hundreds of thousands of people. They came out to the streets in rallies, thousands or tens of thousands at a time, calling for an end to war and the creation of world citizenship and world government. But in the 1950s, the Cold War brought an end, or at least a major reduction, in these and other movements for world citizenship. And for the next 40 or 50 years, the world seemed to be literally split into two opposing camps, communist and capitalist, with completely different political and economic systems. With the Iron Curtain cutting the world in half, many found it impossible to think about world unity. But then in 1989, the Iron Curtain came down, and since then, economic globalization has accelerated at a phenomenal rate. Today, it's very much possible to imagine a unified world. Indeed, we're part way there. The global economy is to a very great extent unified. Air travel and the internet and social media have enabled our social relations and even large parts of our culture to increasingly unify. It's only our political systems that remain resolutely fragmented and disparate. We are so much closer to a unified world now than we were in the 1940s. So much closer. So perhaps it will be possible now, 
With the aid of internet and social media and possibly other new technologies still on the horizon, to galvanize an even larger mass movement than the one in the 1940s. From the North and the South, the East and the West, of social movements, NGOs and ordinary citizens, farmers, students, factory workers, indigenous peoples, environmentalists, refugees, everyone who cares about justice and human rights, to make that final push to make global political unification a reality. Because only then can we get a say in the democratic running of our world. Only then can there really be human rights. And only then can we really become world citizens. <laughs> <laughs>